So I think for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'd like to welcome everyone to exploring value-based opportunities in oral health care for veterans. And our speaker today is Dr. Roshni Ghosh. And before we move into introductions and having Dr. Ghosh present, I wanted to just remind everybody of a little bit of housekeeping. These sessions are in meeting format, so please keep yourself uh, muted and off video while the presenter is, is sharing information during the discussion session. And if the presenter asks you to unmute or to share your video, you certainly can, but we'd like to spotlight the presenter as much as possible and um, remove distractions. Continuing education credits are available and attendance will be verified by codes given at the end of each session. Please keep up with your codes and you will enter them into the evaluation provided at the very end of the conference of day two. Sessions are recorded. They will be made available after the conference via our YouTube channel. And if you're able to add your personal pronouns, you can do that by hovering over your Zoom box, pressing in the top right corner the three buttons, clicking rename, and adding your personal pronouns so that we can promote an inclusive environment. And so with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Roshni Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh Dr. currently serves as the Executive Director for the Center for Care and Payment Innovation in the Office of Healthcare Innovation and Learning, where she oversees the development and implementation of new and innovative care delivery and payment models. Dr. Ghosh is a graduate of the Rutgers University School of Medicine and received her master's in public health from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. Ghosh has also served as Vice President and Chief Medical Information Officer at multiple healthcare consultancies, currently sits on the Board of Directors for a nonprofit healthcare organization, and is an adjunct professor at George Washington University. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Ghosh. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see it just fine. Great. So today I'm going to be talking about exploring value-based opportunities in oral health care for veterans. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview of CCPI, which is the uh, center that I run. Um, that SMILE overview, which is the dental program, the first dental pilot that we're running under CCPI. Um, an area that's very close to me is the veteran need for oral health care and really focusing on the connection between oral health and just general health. And then uh, talking about the impacts and outcomes um, of that smile for veterans. Sorry, I'm just trying to shift my slide. So the Center for Care and Payment Innovation um, was set up through the Mission Act, which is um, short for VA Maintaining Integral Systems and Strengthening Integrated Outside Networks um, of 2018, which was really focused on enhancing the quality of care um, for veterans and looking to improve outcomes and reduce costs, enhance access and reduce disparities, as well as achieve the best health outcomes for all veterans. Um, the other piece of the Mission Act for our office is that they gave us a unique congressional waiver authority, which is really important for um, the pilot that we are running under Vet Smile. So the waiver authority allows our center to change law with congressional approval aligned to a pilot that demonstrates the need for that change in law. And so this, we, set, we created the center, um, it's called the Center for Care and Payment Innovation, and we collaborate across government and industry to really design, evaluate, and hopefully scale innovative payment and service delivery um, approaches. Our first pilot is um, called Vet Smile, and I'll get into that in a second. But some of the areas, so CCPI is tasked with running five to 10 pilots that are focused on care and payment innovation. And so these are some of the areas that we're also focused. Um, we have alternatives to institutional long-term care, where which is a pretty high spend and with the aging population in the VA, we're really trying to figure out what is the best way to provide this 
um, the long-term care for this population. Telehealth and care management um, with the rise of COVID, the VA has done a really good job in terms of implementing telehealth um, across the country. And now what we're focused on is figuring out how to leverage that capability that um, is already in place across the care continuum. Diabetes and end-stage renal failure, again, with the population that we're working with, um, this is a huge concern. And COVID has also actually um, furthered the concern because chronic care management has really been put by the wayside because of um, lack of access to physicians, just the ensuing uh, pandemic. So we wanted to go back and really focus on how do we look at care coordination? How do we figure out, um, how do we restratify the patients that have multiple chronic conditions and um, figure out the best way to make sure that we're not, we're preventing their progression to end stage renal failure. And as I'm going through all this, this is all relevant in the sense that for dental, because dental has, oral care has a piece in most of these um, topic areas. Um, street medicine is something that is exciting for me It's um, and for our group. It's looking at how to treat um, the homeless population where they are. So um, it's a care team that will go and find homeless veterans, um, give them the medical, medical care that they need, but then hopefully be able to bring them back into the, uh, the world of the VA and the social services that are available to them. Um, in terms of telehealth outpatient and policy, um, the VA does send um, a lot of its uh, medical care out to the community. And so we want to make sure that we are understanding how telehealth is being provided there as well as um, what's happening inside the VA. And one of the first payment innovations that we are going to be launching is the bundle as a bundle payment around breast cancer. And we started that as um, we focus on breast cancer because it is actually um, a smaller population within the VA, um, but it also allows us to kind of test the pipes around data and um, partnerships within the VA without making too much of a splash. Um, and the way the, um, this is gonna be set up is that we will build on the best practices of um, what CMS has done, what has happened at the state level. So I'm very excited about that pilot. And then finally, we are looking at innovating um, care pathways in physical therapy. Physical therapy is a very high cost area for the VA. And we're looking to see how we can incorporate virtual reality and other types of options to um, innovate around that. So that's just our center in um, a nutshell. But one of the first pilots that we ran um, in, um, in CCPI is designed um, around dentistry. So the waiver authority that I mentioned before um, is really integral to this pilot. So prior to us um, launching this pilot, uh, the law was that the VA could not refer veterans out to dental care in the community because they would be then responsible for the services and there was a liability around that. Um, so right now, unfortunately, like there's about 85% of veterans, and I'll get into numbers in a second, of veterans who have health benefits who do not have um, VA dental benefits. And the waiver that we requested from Congress was to allow the VA to refer veterans out to dental care partners in the community, um, and they're not responsible for the services. There's there's administrative costs that they can that the our center covers, but they're not responsible for the services. This is the first step, really, in terms of looking at um, lack of dental coverage and where we need to be focusing, and really just identifying the need. Um, so my center is focused on creating basically a network of dental care partners in the community. And we offer comprehensive dental care and we're expanding from preventive oral care all the way to dental restoration. So right now, this is what we're looking at in terms of the need for dental care. Right now, there's 9.2 million veterans enrolled in VA healthcare. Of that, 85% of VHA enrolled veterans are without VA dental benefits. This is something that has been, um, the benefits provided through Congress and this is um, where the benefit is. The benefit has been expanded. I think it used to be around 7% and now it is um, up to 15%. Of the 85%, there's about 1.3 million um, VETSMA eligible um, veterans who have limited access to dental care because of poverty. And that's really the, the area that we want to focus on. Those that don't really have any way of receiving dental care. 
Um, and alongside that, there's about 2.2 million um, BHA enrolled veterans that are living in rural areas who are just less likely to visit a dentist routinely um, because of lack of access or information or even the ability to get to the dentist. We've also um, expanded the program to start looking at the homeless population and the number of unsheltered homeless um, veterans rose significantly over the last year. And um, we wanna make sure that we are addressing that population because oftentimes they may not be in our system as being enrolled in VA um, healthcare, but we can work with the different program offices within VA to identify those veterans. So the anticipated impacts for Vet Smile. Um, this is where it becomes really important to understand why this pilot um, is a really good first pilot for us. So there is um, definitely the connection between oral care and dental care. So my center is supposed to be focused on value-based care and high value care. And I would be remiss to say that, yes, we have run a model around a health condition if that patient has not been receiving um, appropriate oral care. So the financial impact of running a program like this is um, decreased readmission rates, um, probably less ED use, and then lower hospital costs associated with reduced hospital stays because of the impact of routine oral care on some of these chronic conditions. Um, we hope to have improved health conditions of participants and improved physical or mental condition of the patient. The oral side of um, for healthcare, for healthcare, for a patient, it's, it can be really um, damaging if teeth are, if they don't have teeth, if they have gum issues, if they have pain, um, there's a significant impact on the mental condition of the patient, um, but it also um, can prevent them from really flourishing in life and reaching out and being, it can affect them from like career and housing, all these different areas. So we are starting to look at the impact of that too. Um, there's an operational impact where we've increased access to community dental services to establish pathways. As we've been running this program um, and we're expanding from state to state, it's been pretty remarkable how many programs exist and how many um, veteran focused programs exist and how many of the partners, um, which are universities and federally qualified health centers um, have veteran focused efforts. What we're really doing is helping to kind of centralize that and coordinate that and expand it. And then we make sure that the veteran impact is being captured and we um, measure that through patient satisfaction surveys. So the impact of oral health on whole, whole health, right? So the whole value-based piece of this, um, as I mentioned, like oral health has a significant impact. And as of now, it's been hard to make that direct correlation and we may not be able to make that direct correlation, but we can at least start looking at it more closely. So it you know, affects your heart health, there's increasing chance of stroke, there's um, cognitive decline and diabetes. And in fact, if we could get 70% of diabetics dental care, the rate of uncontrolled or poorly controlled diabetes would drop drastically from 34 to 24%. So you can see how all this starts to compound and how all of this would start impacting other programs and other pilots that we would be running. Because if we can kind of address some of these core issues around oral care, those will definitely have impacts on especially the chronic conditions, but some of the other ones too around cognitive health and obesity and depression. As I mentioned, the 70%, um, the emergency department utilization, so the highest population rate of dental related ED visits are those residing in the lowest income communities because um, they face an increased barrier to dental care services. So, as I mentioned before, there's 1.3 million um, veterans that currently fall into that community, and we are really trying to target um, that community. So the way the program is set up um, is that we work with uh, universities, which serve as like kind of the foundation for that state. And then we identify federally qualified health centers whose mission is to really help that lower income community to kind of fill in the gaps um, around that university. So we launched in New Jersey and New York uh, with NYU as a foundational partner. And then we have Rutgers in New Jersey and two pretty large FQHCs and are rapidly expanding. So we literally, we just brought on UPenn, we have um, 
a University of Utah. I think there's one in Alabama. So our focus over the next five years, these are five-year pilots, um, is to expand nationwide um, and make sure that we're, we have a touch point with every state. And then we're also looking to increase access for vulnerable vet veteran populations, right? So that includes the rural and unsheltered veterans, um, but we also want to work with other community and federal partners who have identified other partners in need um, that we, other veterans in need that we can roll up into this program and provide them with access. So right now we're looking at poor oral health management is affecting quality of life. Um, so our goal is to provide a dental home model for the veterans to improve oral health management. This is um, an ask from every dental care partner. So also to explain the program, um, when we as a center are really just a connector. So we're creating a referral network. So when the veteran is connected to a dental care partner, which is normally the university and the FQHC, that veteran becomes their patient for as long as the veteran would want to be their patient. So we are really encouraging a dental home model and a place for the veteran to really have their dental services for the rest of their life. If when the pilot let ends in five years or it could continue on. It depends on what Congress decides at that five-year mark. Um, it's irrelevant for those veterans who have been connected to these partners. That's They are the, your patient at that point. Right now, there's limited dental coverage offered to veterans. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're improving the veteran access to oral health care outside of the VA. Part of my job is also to report back to Congress on the pilot. So we are highlighting the gap and the need and the challenges that we're identifying by state, um, there are different insurance requirements, there are different funding options, there's different types of charity care, um, there's access issues, there's transportation issues, there may not be a university. Um, so all those things are going to be highlighted um, to Congress so they understand the scope of the problem. And then there's a lack of veteran awareness of implications of oral health. So another part of the uh, pilot and the program is really to start educating veterans on the connection of oral health to their whole health. And the population that we're working with probably has a lot of chronic conditions and concurrent ones that um, would benefit from a really good oral hygiene. Um, but alongside of this, which is not on this slide, is that we are also trying to increase the awareness of dental care providers um, around working with the veteran population. There are a lot of um, situations to be mindful of um, from physical um, disability all the way to PTSD and um, other types of depression that um, could really play into um, a dental visit given the lights and things like that. So uh, we have two partners, like two of the universities have centers that are specifically focused on special needs and it's really remarkable what they're able to do, um, but we're focused on also taking the learnings from those centers and um, being able to help educate all of our dental care partners in how to work with veterans um, and to make sure that they're aware of any of the sensitivities that they may need to have um, when working with this population. So if anyone is interested in participating in this program, um, my email is right there. We are looking to expand pretty fast. Um, and as you can imagine, a lot of the states that we are working with, California or Texas are very large and we need multiple partners to really be effective. Um, we don't want to go into a part of the state and then say we have you know, that smile in Texas. We wanna make sure that we're providing as much coverage as possible. But there's a lot of information about the program, um, but I'm also very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ghosh. There are a few questions in the chat, and so I'm happy to read those out, or if, or if you'd like to respond in the chat, you can. It looks like the first question was about getting access to your information, which you already did share in, in case people wanted to follow up on the Vet Smile program. And then there was a question from Carol. How can I find out all of the veteran oral health services in my area? I'm in Iowa and have worked with the Iowa Veterans Trust Fund for dental care, but would like to know if we have other options for those who may be over the poverty guidelines 
but still cannot afford dental care that they need? So the best way right now would be to reach out to me and see if there are contacts in Iowa that we can then reach out to, to um, start the program there. Um, it's pretty um, easy to start the program, but we just need to have contacts and universities. Um, we try to simplify the process as much as possible. That's great. So Carol, I hope that answers your questions. Feel free to keep chatting. Um, just a note that as far as I'm concerned, is that right, Dr. Ghosh, that slides can be forwarded to participants after? Yes, okay. absolutely. And so we'll make sure that that happens. Um, it'll be after the event, we'll post links to all of the slides. Um, and then Steve has left a question and comment in the chat. FQHCs are already beyond capacity with only one out of five health center patients being able to access a dental visit. Same for dental schools. It seems to me that the advocacy to acknowledge oral health as integral to overall health is a key action step. Do you have any responses, Dr. Ghosh? I do. So um, the, you know, the capacity issue has come up often in these presentations, but I will tell you that um, our partners have, have brought that up in terms of like COVID or lack of dentists and things like that, but we work with them in terms of capacity. So we have two different models that we um, undertake in this uh, with our dental care partners. One is a cohort where we identify all the veterans that are eligible, which means that they have um, health benefits, but do not have dental benefits. And then we can stratify it by income. And then we work with the FQHC or the university and ask what are the number of beds or uh, chairs that you have available. And, um, and then we will send out mailers and emails and call them and let the veteran know if they're eligible for this program. And then depending on uptake, we'll, we'll, um, we'll stratify the numbers that we um, send out in terms of mailers, but we are absolutely working with what their capacity is. No one is forced to join, this is all voluntary. Um, and for the universities, what we've done is a referral model. And what that allows for is that we connect directly with the VA Medical Center. And this is where the nice kind of touch point is between medical and dental. The referrals come from the medical side because they know which um, veterans have health benefits and do not have access to dental benefits. And then those names are sent over to the university and then the university can contact them. So they, the veteran has already consented and is interested in receiving dental care. Um, so in terms of capacity, honestly, even if one veteran is seen, it's more than what we had before. Um, and we will work with all the partners in terms of what they're able to do. We stretch out timelines, all that. That's great. I have a follow-up question with the pilot program because I know you're you're working with partners in almost every state, or that's the intention is to work with the with partners in every state. And I imagine that it looks a little bit different based on who you're partnered with yeah. in that state and what the models look like. So is that the intention of the pilot program to sort of test drive some models and figure out what works to develop best practices? Or can you comment on sort of the variety of different models you're experiencing thus far? Absolutely. So we started off with the cohort and the referral model. And then we realized that because of COVID, a lot of it's to get the program started, the cohort model be, might be the way to do it. But then from the referral side, we're learning that the referral can come from multiple places, right? It can come from the homeless program office. It, um, it can come from a, um, a veteran service organization. It can come from a homeless shelter. So we're starting to expand our ability to bring in um, the patients. And then a lot of um, places do have funding that are very focused on special needs and special populations. And we're um, also then starting to customize, like, can we direct the patients that would fit that grant um, um, and then have them be linked up directly? So we are modifying it as we go. Every state is different. Every um, facility is different. And insurance is different. So we need to align to that too. So we are capturing all this. And at some point we will probably have this massive map of 50 states and all the things that are happening, but that's part of our job too, of what we report back to Congress. Oh, that's really interesting. I'm curious about with all of the different varieties and models of care and, you know, kind of testing what works and what doesn't work. Are there some key indicators and metrics that you're looking for for your program that you're kind of saying, okay, these are our metrics for success or these are the outcomes that we're particularly looking for across all of these models? One is just, you know, 
a passion towards helping populations that don't have access. Um, and then really the second one is um, wanting to help maintain a medical a dental home for these um, individuals. Other than that, um, I, I'm a physician. So I've come into the dental world and I am um, very impressed with um, how this world has run all the different types of care coordination that's been put into place. So um, I'm learning a lot too, but in terms of lessons learned, I think those are like, or like kind of like our intent, those are really the two main things. That's great. I actually think that's really important is the passion piece. I know that that's something that we've noticed with AIDPH doing this work is that people are so engaged because they feel very personally connected to the cause and wanting to really invest in, in veteran care. Um, and I want to highlight what Fritz put in the chat here. How are the schools reimbursed for veteran dental services or is it considered pro bono? So, okay, so that's, um, it's not considered, it's not pro bono care. We're not, there's no requirement around that. NYU does do pro bono care for all the veterans. Um, they have a different funding uh, mechanism to be able to do that. Um, the waiver is really asking for discounted care and working with any university or QHC, the care is discounted from what it would be in private practice. Um, we are very careful to um, let the veteran know what the expectations are. We want them to use their insurance if they're not connected to the right type of insurance? How do we help them get that insurance? Um, unfortunately, we are not able to pay for the services. That's kind of where this program kind of came about. But working with all the universities, um, we, they are able to kind of work within the uh, model that we have. It's providing them you know, with patients for their students and the facilities are gorgeous and the veterans are getting incredible care. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of like a nice kind of you know, partnership there. Um, and then, you know, we hope to be doing research too that will be um, kind of connecting the dots between our own health um, as we start building um, kind of our partnership. Oh, that's really interesting. So the research piece of it, what are sort of the ideals or aspirations for what you hope to uncover through the research piece? Um, and I know I keep beating this to death, but really the connection with oral and health um, and, and healthcare. Um, but then also looking at like, you know, what practices are working, what practices, um, especially for a special needs population, um, what are some of the things that we're learning about providing care, about access. Um, I think as we get into more of the rural areas, we're learning a lot about how to provide care. The stand downs that um, oftentimes um, a lot of these groups do, we want to be able to kind of put the full VA participation behind it. Um, but it's, it's really like, um, it, we're going to actually do kind of a call for action on this um, once we start getting some of the um, universities on board to see what their interests are. And I know a lot of people are already doing research. So how do we align to that? How do we support it? Um, and it doesn't have to be like, it could be white papers. It could be, you know, thought pieces too. So we're laying out our strategy for that right now. Well, that's exciting. I can't wait to learn more about that and respond to your call to, call to action. I'm sure there are lots of advocates here on this call who would love to respond to. Uh, I want to call out Teresa's question in the chat. How many veterans have um, received care thus far through the Vet Smile pilot program? So we launched on July 1st of last year. And so far, we've seen 950 unique veterans, I think. Um, and it's continuing to grow. And that's just, we're looking at New York and New Jersey. Um, one of the things too, I do wanna mention is that we have really strong partnerships, strategic partnerships um, with the ADA, with um, NAC, um, and we're forming a partnership with ADA, ADEA. We work closely with VA Dentistry. So um, they've all been incredible partners in helping us identify partners and fill in gaps and figure out like, how to address some of the issues that we're seeing by state. That's perfect. And I wanted to actually revisit um, uh, what you kind of talked about in the beginning around the eligibility piece and sort of why this pilot program is in existence because there are at least 85% of veterans who are not eligible. And you know, one thing we uncovered um, AIDPH and CareQuest through our white paper that we released last year was um, that you know within that 15%, it looks like the utilization rate is still pretty low, about one third. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or feedback on you know how we can improve the uh, accessing the resources that are currently available alongside expanding models of care like what you're doing with CCPI. 
So unfortunately, I don't really have um, as much kind of insight on the VA dentistry side. I know that they are working as hard as possible to ensure that all the dental, um, all the veterans that are eligible for dental benefits receive the care that they need. Um, I think that just with COVID and with kind of the lack of resources all around, that's probably why some of those numbers are there. But um, that office is very singularly focused to make sure that the um, the veterans that do have dental um, benefits are getting the best care that they can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so also thinking through some of the information you presented earlier and really delving into the value-based piece. So I'm with you and I echo the need for care integration and effective care integration that really considers the whole person health of the veteran. So oral health, medical, mental, all of those great things. And I'm wondering if you have any insight that you can share with us about, you know, kind of where the largest opportunities are for value-based payments and care and sort of how that would mesh together, um, either within the pilot program or just generally, how you feel like there are opportunities for us to expand and build on that. I think with this, with the dental side and the connections to healthcare, it really would probably be on complex care management, complex conditions. Um, and there's a lot of different models out there. You can do episodic care, you can do bundles. Um, but what I'm starting to recognize too, as we start, we're doing a bunch of research and strategy sessions around what's already out there. And because dentistry has not really been kind of considered in these models, I think there's a unique opportunity for us now to, it might be longer term, but to be able to say, okay, well, if these veterans did not have dental care and now are receiving dental care and now have these health conditions. So, what, can, what, is, what is the improved health outcome that is um, currently a correlation of that? Um, one of the other pieces of our waiver is that we request that the encounter of um, the dental encounter comes back to the veteran record. So right now it's coming back in a very basic format, but ideally we'll be able to then know that the veteran has had dental care and be able to start connecting the dots that way because now we have the health record connecting with the, de um, the dental um, encounters. So then that way you can really loop those medical and dental outcomes together. And yeah. Kind of, that's great. That's exciting. I mean, it sounds simple, but it's not. <laughs> but we are, <laughs> but we're going to work through that and see what kinds of studies and things that we can set up with that population. That's really exciting work. Uh, I want to call out that uh, we have a comment in the chat. What are you doing with veterans that are not qualified for general services at the VA? It sounds like the pilot program is one of those options. Are there any other thoughts that you have for that 85% of veterans who are not qualified for those services? I mean, this is really the way to um, for them to access the care. Um, I think that there is still some nuance around those may, that may be dishonorably discharged and don't have health benefits, but um, ultimately, I don't think our partners really care about that. So if there is a veteran that comes in um, that isn't a vet smile person, but needs care, I am pretty much sure that they would see them. So, um, and then there's also a way for the veterans, if they don't have dental insurance with the dental insurance program too, that the VA has set up that they can um, opt into. Good information. My other thought here too, and you've mentioned some of the partners that you're currently working with or that you're you know, making established relationships with. I'm wondering how you view stakeholders generally and sort of supporting veteran dental care. I know, um, and, and we've seen this now in our first presentation and, and even chatting with our partners in the lounge during the coffee session, we know there's a lot of people doing work around veteran dental care and it's kind of hard to figure out who's doing what and where and how we can work together. And I'm wondering if you can kind of go through what you feel like st key stakeholders can focus on um, in their efforts in supporting veteran dental care care, even outside of the pilot program, what should we be doing and where's our call to action? Yeah, so um, veteran service organizations um, probably know the veteran population the best. Um, and then there are veteran nonprofits that are really working so hard to find funding to help veterans that are in need of receiving dental care and uh, medical care. So I think an opportunity within communities to connect all the different pieces, right? So those that are focused on providing transportation might be one group. 
Another group is focused on providing some funding. Another group can identify the veterans or has a shelter where a lot of veterans are um, using or utilizing. So how do you connect that? So a lot of that comes down to um, working with a ver your state veteran service organizations or their like, you know, other groups that are really focused on veterans. But then outside of the pilot, I think our pilot does have some responsibility when we go to these states to help coordinate and connect all the dots too. And so we've been starting to do that in some of the um, states that we're working in. North Carolina has um, an incredible nonprofit that's working in the rural areas. And we're trying to help them kind of figure out like, how do you connect with this program? Um, the other piece too, is I know that there are a lot of um, ADA Lifeline, they have um, private dentists that are offering very costly services to individuals, not always veterans, but what we are trying to now navigate is, okay, so where does that person go if it's a veteran? They've received all this care. It's probably cost prohibitive for them to stay with, it, with the private practitioner. Now, can we connect them to um, a vet smile dental care provider, right? So they, the big need has been addressed and now they're gonna go into a dental home model and continue that um, effort that was already provided, this huge effort that was provided, but now they have a path forward. So there's all these different components. And I said, every state has amazing people doing amazing things, but like the central point of coordination is um, I think really important. And that's hard to do when you're hands, like, you know, heads down trying to just kind of do the work that you're trying to do. So we have the opportunity to kind of like build a strategy around the states outside of just bringing in dental care partners of all the different services. And we've engaged the VA and the different program offices within the VA to, to understand what are the benefits that are available, like for those who are homeless, those who need mental health services, so that um, individuals know where to connect them to. That's great. So it kind of leads me to my final question. If there are no other chats, uh, no other questions in the chat, which is, you know, how do you feel like we can support the work that you're doing? How can the people here, representing all of these diverse stakeholder groups, how can we really support the Vet Smile program, the VA generally, or your particular um, organization investment? I know you're serving as a coordination point. It sounds like. How can we support your efforts? One is around probably um, data and research. We are always looking for good, clean data. We are gonna be partnered with CareQuest, which I'm like, very excited about. Um, and then I think that we're always gonna find gaps on the rural side, rural and access to care issues there. Um, we're gonna to have to change our model um, where it may not be a university because it's not close enough. It may not be an F2HC. So what are some of the other community and, um, offerings around dental? And we won't know that, right? We, we need um, individuals to help us um, learn about those programs. And then I think, um, as you mentioned, all these people are doing really great stuff for veterans. Um, we just have to know about it. Like people have to tell us about it and then we can take it from there. But if we don't know about it, we can't, um, we can't leverage it. We can't help them. We can't help them grow. Um, and I think also this serves as a really great place for us to learn and about what you're hearing about the program, if there's some changes that we could be making, um, if there are challenges that are that are being identified that we can help um, communicate around, educate around. Um, you know, we have a we have a pretty good platform to really um, let teach veterans about the importance of oral care, but then also um, highlight the gap in the need. So. That's wonderful. I hope everyone is taking notes and knows that they can reach out to Dr. Ghosh. I know Carol is asking for your email. I think that's probably going to be in your slides. It's the last slide. Perfect. So we'll share that out with attendees so that everybody has access to that information and can contact Dr. Ghosh. Um, and so from there, I'm going to also echo the chat comment. Thank you so much, Dr. Ghosh. We certainly appreciate your presentation today. Um, I know I feel very excited about the work that you're doing and thank you for, for doing that on behalf of veterans. And so I'm going to read out the CEU code for the session, which is value 215 VET. Again, value 215 VET. And you can use that to access continuing education credits at the end of the conference through the evaluation sent out at the end um, on day two. So keep all of these codes handy to enter there.